I just would like to begin by congratulating EPSJ on its 10th anniversary. So congratulations to the two Masakis, the other officers of the society, and to all of the members who must work hard all the time to support the society. And thank you all for inviting me here to well, thank you for inviting me to come and give a paper and for treating me so kindly. I must say we've been uh, greeted with tremendous uh, generosity and hospitality. And although I've only been in Kochi, or maybe I should say Kochi, for, <laughs> for two days, I already feel entirely at home here. In recent years, there have really been two hot topics in uh, the discussion of English pronunciation, certainly from the viewpoint of a British phonetician. One of these may seem a bit insular, it's a British topic, and that is the topic of so-called estuary English, though I was interested to hear it was, it was Geoffrey, I think, this morning who mentioned it even then. So clearly this idea, the idea that there is maybe some kind of new accent around, uh, has got beyond Britain into the wider field of English language studies. The second idea, and to my mind a more important one, is the realization over the last 20 years or so that as English is now an international language, or as some people say, the basis of a lingua franca, a me method of international communication, this must have implications for the study and teaching of English pronunciation, and of course it must. If I take a quick look at these two topics, first looking at estuary English. Estuary English has uh, been claimed to be possibly the basis of a new standard accent. Some people think that it might replace RP as the standard British accent to be um, adopted by people who wish to speak English. I don't know if that will ever be the case. There's a lovely collection of articles and materials about estuary English which you can get to on the UCL homepage. You don't really need to copy down the URL if you can get to the UCL phonet Phonetics and Linguistics homepage and type in estuary, you'll get this. Th these are uh, resources maintained by John Wells. Uh, just a few snapshots of parts of this resource. Essentially an enormous bibliography of all kinds of books and articles, news items, many of them actually written by John Wells himself, because he has made important contributions to the idea, the study of estuary English. Just a, a picture of some of the books and titles that you find there if you don't already know. But among those, there is uh, one outstanding contribution, and I think probably the one that John Wells, like me, regards as the most significant, a, a book which is a thesis written a few years ago by a Pole, Joanna Pritzlatska, which is a proper socio-phonetic study of speakers from the region who might be expected to be speakers of estuary English, if anyone is. And you'll notice that her book is entitled Estuary English, or Estuary English with a question mark. And the question essentially is answered in the negative, the answer being there isn't really any one thing that is estuary English. What she finds is lots of essentially local accents which resemble London English to some extent, but are nevertheless differentiated one from the other. Her study was a very careful socio-phonetic study but there is plenty of room for further study. There's a need for replication and a need for acoustic measurements. And right now I have two students just beginning research projects which will use the same 
the materials, the same questionnaire as Pridzlatska, but we will be making acoustic measurements of recordings as well as the, the impressionistic judgments that Joanna made in her study. I don't know if you have looked at her, her dissertation, but if not, I would recommend you to do so. It's a very important piece of work. Just a sample of something, this is probably illegible, but this is a tiny part of her data for one vowel in one locality from four speakers. And it's examples of what John Wells calls the goat vowel, the diphthong which we say is O in British English, but it does depend on the context a little. And uh, there's uh, a huge variety of uh, realizations evident among uh, informants. The informants are the columns and the words in which the O vowel is to be found are the rows, and then each cell has whatever realization was found in that word. You've got evidence of the fronting and unrounding of the second element of O, producing realizations like O, O, tomorrow, this kind of thing. You've got evidence of essentially the emergence of an entirely new phoneme, O, which is in places where a dark L should come afterwards. So there's a difference between O and O now in southeastern English. And there's also evidence of the loss of the L, the vocalization of the L, which is a feature of these accents. And also it's possible to see here that contrary to what one might have expected, the loss of L is actually more strongly marked in the middle class speakers than in the working class speakers. Uh, so the working class speakers are more, co more conservative in that respect than the middle class ones. Exactly the opposite of what you would assume if you just thought, well, you know, what's happening here? So at the moment, um, at the moment, estuary English hasn't really had an impact on the description of English as far as, uh, for instance, recording pronunciations in the dictionary goes. We've added some comments about the use of block of stops, but that's not really an estuary feature. It's a general feature in both British and American English. The other topic I mentioned, the other hot topic in the last 20 years, and more especially in the last five years or so, is the realization that English really is an international language now. And as we're constantly being reminded, more people speak and use English who are not native speakers of English than those people who use it because they're native speakers from Britain or the United States or Australia. Uh, more people use English who have learned English as a method of communication than those who learned it as their mother tongue. And here, the most significant publication in recent years is the book by Jenny Jenkins <coughs> called The <coughs> Phonology of English as an International Language. Again, you, you probably know this book, but if not, I would recommend you to get a copy and read it straight away. Um, in my small way, I have tried to foster uh, Jenny Jenkins' ideas among my phonetics colleagues. But uh, how have I done this? Well, by inviting her to come and give seminars uh, or to come and speak to the summer course of English phonetics. When she comes and explains her ideas, saying that because now there are more speakers of English who are not native speakers, <coughs> We should modify our expectations of learners of English and set up different goals for pronunciation, then she tends to get what, using an English idiom, could be described as a rough ride. She gets hostile questions from the audience and from the teachers. You know, there are no more conservative people about English pronunciation than teachers of English pronunciation. Uh, that is conservative about pronunciation. I don't know about your other views, but uh, <laughs> uh, 
and obviously this is because people have worked all their lives to learn all about the pronunciation, spent their lives, devoted their lives to studying it and teaching it, and then what happens? We go and change it. <laughs> and this doesn't seem to be fair, thank you. <laughs> but it's no good pretending. I have in the past met teachers from abroad who wanted to go on using Daniel Jones' transcription or insisted in working from uh, pronouncing dictionaries that were 30 or 40 years out of date because that's what they had learned from. But we, we have to look to the present and the future and not, not cling to the past. When in the summer we hosted a phonetics teaching and learning conference in London, a PTLC, one of the presenters there, another Pole, Katarzyna Jaska Kowacik, delivered a paper which was a critique of Jennifer Jenkins. Again, you can find this on the UCL website, all the papers from PTLC are freely available to read or download from the home page. And uh, to use another English idiom, what Katarzyna did with uh, Jenny's ideas was a hatchet job. She went through and demolished each one, one after another, and she got a lot of applause and everyone thought, yes, that's it. <laughs> And of course, she didn't actually make any mistakes. She, what she said was correct at every stage. In particular, she points out that we can't invent a new kind of English. We can't pretend it already exists and decide what should be in it. Um, this is just Katarzyna's summary of the numbers of speakers. And we get on to the lingua franca core. This is Jenny Jenkins' idea of the the really crucial parts of English pronunciation that have to be focused on to facilitate international communication. Um, you can't read the details here, but it, it does some rather surprising things. If you're committed to teaching English and uh, paying attention to the details of English pronunciation as used by native speakers, you don't like things like uh, not bothering with dark L, uh, thinking that rhythm, intonation, and firmness stylistics are not that important. Give up trying with TH sounds. None of this is worth the effort. Um, and of course, uh, everybody who had struggled for years to learn these things and to find good ways of teaching them says, yeah, this is all wrong. We must keep on doing this. And you get on to the criticism, is the lingua franca, franca core an invented language? If it is, if this idea of a, a kind of stripped-down version of English with a strange pronunciation that is nobody's native pronunciation, is this something artificial and invented, in which case it may not even be learnable, because you can't just invent something and assume that people can learn it. We can only learn things which are known to be learnable. We know natural languages are learnable because children learn them, but if you invent a language, there's no guarantee at all that anybody can learn it. <coughs> and of course, <coughs> I, I applauded, but I was also thinking, actually, this isn't, the, this isn't the appropriate argument. This isn't what it's about. Because there's a distinction between, I believe anyway, there's a distinction to be drawn between what is described, what is taught, and then what is learnt. At the moment, there is no international English pronunciation to describe. When it eventually emerges, if it emerges, then we shall try to analyze it and describe it. But even now, without an established international pronunciation of English, what is described is distinct from what is taught. We don't teach everything that we know or everything that we can find out about a language. Every language teacher, and especially every pronunciation teacher, knows that you have to set priorities. 
you have only a certain amount of time and you have to decide which features shall I focus on and try to get right. You don't just pick up every little error that your learners make. You spend every hour responding to the errors that occurred in the first 30 seconds of the learner's speech. And this would be a waste of everybody's time. What is described is in our reference materials. It's in our corpora, in our reference grammars, in our dictionaries. But they are not the materials from which we teach. Of course, they should be freely available to students. Students need free access to as much information as they want. We mustn't only give them what we decide to give them. They need independently to be able to find out for themselves, because many learners trace their own path and find out for themselves, not following the sequence of events that we think will be logical. What is taught is what we put in our course books or online courses. And so there we have made selections. We've decided what will be important. And the, the resolution of the problem, which allows me to agree with both Jenny Jenkins on the one hand and Katarzyna on the other hand, is that Jenny Jenkins is talking about what should be taught. She's not saying it really is like this. She's saying, what do we need to focus on? She's not saying, stop them learning TH sounds, <laughs> stop them getting good intonation, native-like intonation. What she is saying is, in the limited time available, you're better off concentrating on something else, because it's more likely to facilitate good communication. The third item in this list is what is learned. And this is distinct, again, from what is taught, in my opinion. And I don't know if you can read the bottom of the screen, but maybe I'll be able to move it up. In my opinion, what is learned is totally out of our control, especially for English. So what is learned is totally out of our control. The reason being that wherever you go, students are getting English from every direction. We don't control the English input to our students. We describe a certain kind of English, whether it be American or British English. We teach something else. If the teacher is a Canadian or a Scot, then what is effectively being taught may be different from what's in the reference books the student has. That doesn't matter. But what is learnt is an amalgam of what you're teaching and everything else the student is exposed to and is picking up. So what's learnt emerges, really. It emerges from all of the influences that are playing on the student. It's because of this three-way distinction that I don't get too bothered about what model of English pronunciation should serve as the basis for the dictionary. In a way, it doesn't matter. I can describe one consistent thing. That's a source of information. But by making a choice, by saying, oh, this is modern RP, I'm not controlling the, the learners. They're not necessarily going to acquire modern RP as a result of being uh, exposed to it in, in the grammar books and reference books that we're using. Now, how does the, this argument affect me personally? As uh, Yoshiki said, I'm the pronunciation editor of OALD, which claims to be one of the largest selling books of all time, 30 million copies. Um, in case you're beginning to wonder, no, I don't get royalties on 30 million books. <laughs> uh, I've been the pronunciation editor for three editions. I think I'm the longest serving pronunciation editor the book has ever had. <clears throat> Some were hired and fired immediately when the sales went down. But uh, so far the sales are going up, so I'm doing okay. <laughs> uh, I've also been the pronunciation editor of a, a family of related dictionaries, all kinds of dictionaries like the elementary dictionary, a dictionary of idioms and a dictionary of phrasal verbs. All of the Oxford ELT dictionaries draw on the same database, which is the database we've gradually constructed 
over the last 12, 15 years. But the ELT dictionaries have nothing to do with the so-called academic dictionaries, like the concise Oxford Dictionary or the Oxford Dictionary of Pronunciation. Um, and to be honest, I don't like either of those <laughs> um, too much. Uh, I hope it isn't disloyal, but uh, Oxford, o OUP is a vast organization, and to use yet another idiom, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing, and they certainly don't use the same database or the same computer systems. I wish I could get my hands on the other dictionaries and alter them, but I can't. <laughs> Here's a picture of some of the other dictionaries, a dictionary of phrasal verbs, dictionary of idioms. They all draw on the same database and use the same treatment of pronunciation. As uh, Yoshiki mentioned, the seventh edition has just appeared. And a big advantage of the seventh edition is that it comes with a CD from which, from which the whole um, from which the whole dictionary can be installed onto your computer. That's why I was able to bring a copy with me. The book itself is too heavy. As one of the delegates complained to me yesterday, he was still using an earlier edition because he got it in a small copy. Now the English language dictionaries are in competition with each other for weight, I think, and they're getting thicker and bigger. Uh, but the CD, the program, the software, weighs nothing once you've installed it on your computer. And of course, the big advantage is that uh, on the computer, you can consult it very rapidly, and you can search for things. This is a big difference. Naturally, it also has spoken versions of the words, which people tend to pick on first as a big plus from the pronunciation point of view. Well, yes, it is a plus, but I think rapid access and the ability to search are even more important advantages. The distinction between what's described and what is taught <clears throat> is relevant to me because the OLD is both a, uh, a description of English and a, a tool for teaching. So the description has to be tailored to the needs of learners. Uh, this means that uh, although I can only show pronunciations which are known to exist, I have to represent them in such a way that they will be useful to learners. I've got to decide which pronunciation is best to give. Bearing in mind that some learners are using the dictionary to look up American pronunciations rather than British ones. So one principle I have is that where one pronunciation will do for both British and American, I choose that one. That seems a very logical thing to do. I mean, let's face it, from the, from the point of view of most learners of English, the difference between British English and American English is just a nuisance. They wish it would go away. As dialect differences in languages go, they're not very different. Other languages have bigger differences between adjacent villages than we have between British and American English, at least in the standard varieties. But nevertheless, there are sufficient differences to cause trouble when people start using their dictionaries and grammar books. And like the learners, I wish it would go away, but it, it, unfortunately it won't. So behind the scenes, what is a very simple dictionary, all kinds of work is going on. Often the result in the dictionary is one little mark, or in fact nothing happening in the dictionary after maybe two years of work to figure out what should be done. The result is nothing. <laughs> but that isn't because we've missed it out, it's because we've worked out exactly what we should do and decided it's no good for the learner. To give a simple example, if you tried to use uh, John Wells's Longman Pronunciation Dictionary or the EPD, the English Pronouncing Dictionary, you'll know that both of them make use of abbreviatory devices to collapse several pronunciations into one formulaic representation. And as you look at the dictionary, you'll see little superscripts, a schwa up in the air, or sometimes certain symbols are italicized. 
And of course, what these mean is that you are to expand the representation, and it then represents two or more different pronunciations. But even my best students can't understand this. They carefully copy down the italic symbols and the little diacritics, thinking that this is a careful representation of pronunciation. So if I write bottle and put in a whole schwa, somebody's sure to put up a hand and say, but the dictionary's only got a little schwa. Of course, it, it's just a device for saying you may have the schwa or you may not, but people just don't understand that. So as far as the OALD is concerned, I can't have formulae of that kind. It must be immediately readable uh, by people who, let's face it, by people who aren't, aren't even going to look at the back cover and see what the symbols mean. It's no good having representations that have to be decoded in relation to a list of instructions. Very few people will actually look at the instructions. <coughs> So the behind-the-scenes thing I, I thought I'd give you a glimpse of today is the treatment of idioms in these dictionaries. An interesting thing about idioms is that sometimes the special or idiomatic meaning can be destroyed by the accentual pattern. For example, we have an idiom in English to have eyes in the back of one's head, <clears throat> which means to be very observant, to notice things even when you think nobody would notice them. And so we can say things like the second line there, she has eyes in the back of her head. This means you can't, uh, you can't conceal anything from her, she's bound to notice. But if we were to move the nucleus from head to back, we get an effect which usually makes native speakers of English laugh. We get, she has eyes in the back of her head. Now, native speakers find this funny because you are forced to the literal interpretation of the idiom. It can only mean, actually, she does have eyes in the back of her head. Um, even though, logically, back is a good place to put the nucleus, if you follow most of the rules about what to do with the nucleus, everyone has eyes in their head, so head is not an important word. Therefore, <laughs> what about back? Well, most people's eyes are in the front of their head, therefore back is the logical place to put the nucleus. But the fact is, if you want it to have the idiomatic meaning, you can't say that. She has eyes in the back of her head. Either it's literal, or more likely it's a clever joke. Somebody says it to make a bit of wordplay. It isn't just that idiom, it works for all kinds of idioms. Do you know the idiom to have a chip on one's shoulder? This means to be sensitive about an event that happened in the past in such a way that if people talk about it, you then get upset. To, to harbor some kind of a grudge. Now notice, John has a chip on his shoulder. This means he has this kind of feeling. This time the nucleus is on chip. If you put the nucleus on shoulder, John has a chip on his shoulder, it literally means that uh, maybe somebody threw a McDonald's out of the window and one of the chips has landed on his shoulder. Uh, this is true of uh, British English. I'm aware that some idioms don't work in quite the same way in American English. Uh, and maybe I can talk to our American friends later about this, but uh, nobody said no so far. Now, I had a feeling that uh, we had to prevent learners of English from getting these patterns wrong. And the solution I came up with in the dictionaries is to mark one stress, mark one stress in the idiom, and this is the location of the nucleus if the idiom has got a nucleus in it. So to have a chip on one's shoulder means the idiomatic thing I mentioned. Have a bee in one's bonnet means to have something that you're particularly bothered or interested about. Push the boat out means to make a big fuss, spend a lot of money, go to a lot of trouble. In every case, if you shift the nucleus, you don't have the idiomatic meaning.
have a chip on one's shoulder, is literal. A bee in your bonnet actually means there is an insect in your hat. And push the boat out is opposite to push the boat in. So the solution for the learner is to mark a stress. But being a linguist, a phonetician and a linguist, I started asking, well, why is this? This is very strange. And is the stress pattern of idioms really fixed? If you think about it, idioms are popularly thought to be whole entries in a, the mental lexicon, chunks of language stored in one piece. So there's some initial attractiveness in the idea that maybe the prosodic pattern is stored along with the words. But when you start looking more closely, you find that this can't be the case. Is the prosody of idioms really fixed as it appears to be for the learner? And I think the answer is no. That's the hypothesis there. The prosodic patterns of idioms are fixed and stored in the lexicon. <clears throat> but actually, not all aspects are fixed. If we take, she has eyes in the back of her head, we may or may not put an accent on eyes. We may pause after eyes. We may or may not put an accent on back. We may pause after back. If the idiom is stored as one chunk, how come you've got so much freedom to do all those things? There are at least 16 variants just taking those uh, categories. So it can't be that idioms are a kind of sound bite that's stored in your mind and then just run out like a little file when you come to it. So I came up with a different hypothesis that what is fixed is not the location of the nucleus, but actually the focus specification of the idiom. This explains why not only what is fixed, but why idioms go wrong when you alter. If the, if the prosodic pattern of an idiom were merely fixed, then departing from that prosodic pattern should just sound wrong. But actually, it sounds funny. So there's got to be an explanation of why it's funny. And the reason it sounds funny is that when you shift the nucleus in an idiom, you're, and it goes wrong, you're actually trying to put into different focus domains, pieces of material that don't actually have compositional meaning. They're in the same non-compositional chunk. So if you say cats and dogs, it's raining cats and dogs, you get the literal meaning the animals falling out of the sky, because uh, cats is being put in the background. Uh, and hence, uh, whereas, uh, uh, dogs, and, and this is in a different focus domain. So you're trying to introduce a focus distinction into a non-compositional part of the idiom. A chip on his shoulder is dividing chip from shoulder by putting chip into the background. The really clinching evidence, and this, this is what, as they say, the knockdown argument, <laughs> is that you, you discover that idioms can have sometimes two acceptable patterns. But the cases where the idiom has two patterns are always those where the literal meaning has two patterns as well. So uh, what is happening, what seems to be happening in the um, idioms is the focus specification is fixed. You see that to leave, leave the door open, and leave the door open. I think I got this example from Yoshiki, who found an inconsistency between two of my dictionaries. I'd done one in one place and the other in another place, and then when I thought about it, the answer is both are okay, and both have the same broad focus. Uh -huh. So uh, leave the door open and leave the door open, it's the, it's the same as uh, leave your coat on, leave your coat on. There's no difference in the focus specification in structures of that sort. Same with the jury's out and the jury's out. How am I doing for time? Ten, ten more minutes. Ten minutes before questions. Yes. Yeah. Okay. In that case, we, we can take a little break and watch some TV. Um, 
there's a, a famous uh, psycholinguistic experiment from 20 odd years ago about listeners distinguishing idiomatic and literal meanings with no external cues having to rely on prosodic cues in the material. Um, and Van Lanker and Cantor did an experiment where they found that listeners actually could tell out of context whether they were listening to idiomatic language or literal language, which led them to believe there must be prosodic cues somehow accompanying the two kinds of uh, utterance which enable the listeners to tell. I've got an example maybe of, um, of this. Yeah, they, they then analyzed some uh, recordings of idiomatic and literal record, uh, speech and found that the literal renderings tended to have longer durations, more pauses, and more pitch accents than the idiomatic one. And this fitted in with the idea current at the time that the idioms were stored as chunks in the brain because if you're going to get out the whole chunk and say it, then you'll be able to say it more quickly than if you're assembling it from separate words. And it will therefore have fewer pauses and fewer accents. Do you know the idiom, my ears are burning? It means I think I can hear somebody talking about me or sense somebody talking about me. In this little clip from The Simpsons, Homer uses the idiom. Uh, I'll see if we can play it. I like him. He's smart, he's sensitive, he's clearly not obsessed with his physical appearance. My ears are burning. Uh, I wasn't talking about you, Dad. Oh, my ears are really burning. I wanted to see inside, so I lit a Q-tip. <laughs> Dear Mr. Sherman, on behalf of the people... Did you get that? <laughs> The little girl says some complimentary things. Homer says, my ears are burning, meaning, oh, she's talking about me in a flattering way. Uh, and then, of course, you see the smoke coming out of his ears, and he's actually set his ears on fire. And it's the, it's the literal meaning, my ears are really burning. Well, when you analyze those, you find that it fits very well with the Van Lanker and Cantor uh, hypothesis. Um, this is... Homer saying, my ears are burning. He's using a stylized fall. There's one accent on ears. Uh, that's where the pitch reaches a peak. And then it levels off. This is the da-da-da-da-da uh, calling contour or stylized fall on which he chants this thing, saying, she's talking about me, you see. Then when he clarifies, it's true he adds the word really, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, because here he is doing exactly what Van Lenker and Cantor said. My ears are really burning. He's putting more accents into it. Uh, and this goes with the idea of the literal meaning. Uh, the bottom line, again, is the fundamental frequency contour. And you can see there are three pitch accents in there, three big pitch accents, one on each of the places where we would transcribe an accent. Unfortunately, the two renderings uh, don't quite match Van Lanker and Cantor because the durations are wrong. The literal one is actually faster, even though he's added the word really. It's shorter than my ears are burning. <laughs> so uh, only some of their uh, uh, suggestions are borne out. So, Again, this is where what I'm doing now comes into it. Uh, first of all, I have another explanation of why Van Lanker and Cantor found the results they did. And this is shortly to appear in Journal of Pragmatics. The, the, my idea is actually, it's nothing to do with what they thought. It's not different processing loads of literal and idiomatic language. It's actually that their speakers were introducing focus distinctions in all the literal versions. And the listeners are good at picking up these focus distinctions and deciding whether they're hearing literal or idiomatic. Unfortunately, the original experiment had no controls for focus. And so what we have to do is do a replication of the experiment, controlling and measuring the focus effects. And we're just beginning to get the results of that. This is work I'm doing with Katie Mackay, 
and we, we're currently writing this up for publication. Don't know where it will appear yet, but this involved getting six speakers to record both literal and idiomatic versions. Now, what we did, we took a sentence like, he was skating on thin ice, which means either he was skating on a lake or he was taking a risk. And then we wrote two little stories. In one, the man is really skating on a frozen lake, but it's too thin. And in the other, he's taking an entirely different kind of risk. Uh, but identically the same words occur in the two passages. So the, the speakers read the two stories, they don't have no idea what's going on, and then we cut out the bit, he was skating on thin ice, and we put them together in a pair in random order. So the listener just hears, he was skating on thin ice, he was skating on thin ice. We know one is literal and one is idiomatic, when I listened to them, I thought, this is hopeless, I can't tell which is which. You just think you, you've got something, and then the next pair you listen to, no, it can't be that, no. <laughs> you know, it's the other way around. So we had 20 listeners, and each of these 20 listeners heard 168 pairs. It's a big experiment, a lot of data. And, oh yeah, that's, that's the, he was skating on the nice just to uh, show you the idiom. And this is the results, the raw results for 20 listeners. The score out of 136 is on the um, vertical axis. And the numbers along the bottom are just listener numbers. The scores have been arranged into a neat distribution going up. So nobody got a very low score, nobody got a very high score. <coughs> and the scores are fairly compactly uh, distributed. But this gets interesting when you draw into the graph where the chance level is, and it's there. So three of the listeners are operating close to chance, and 17 out of 20 can do better than chance. And some people can do amazingly better than chance. Uh, the, ch the, the probability of 17 out of 20 listeners doing better than chance is in itself about two parts in a thousand, less than two parts in a thousand. It can't possibly be a random result. There has to be some way of doing this. It means that somewhere in those ident apparently identical utterances, there is a clue. Uh, and a preliminary analysis of the data, I don't have a slide to show you, but uh, it's almost too good to be true. It looks as if all and only the pairs where the literal version carries a focus distinction are responsible for the high success rate overall. If we get rid of the pairs where there was a focus distinction, then uh, there are no significant differences left. Are we almost finished? Or? Almost. Almost. Um, I think I may uh, leave idioms. You've probably had enough of idioms. It's one of my hobby horses. International English has come into the background of OALD. You may know there's a thing called the Vienna-Oxford International Corpus of English. This is a corpus of international uh, exchanges run by uh, Barbara Zeidelhofer, who is known as a, an expert on pronunciation, but at the moment the corpus isn't interested in pronunciation, but in grammatical issues. And there is actually now an appendix in the dictionary about English as an international language, as a lingua franca. Uh, the corpus shows all kinds of things happening in international English. The omission of third person singular markers, invariant uh, articles and um, uh, non-standard pluralizations, informations instead of information, very common kind of thing, non-standard non articles. You hear this all the time. I heard somebody the other day saying, we have an air conditioning. Um, it's gone off.
this is this one am I back on I thought maybe that was the chairman's way of shutting me up <laughs> The point I'm making is you can't have change on this scale without some pronunciation implications. This is almost pigeonization or creolization in progress. And you're not going to get a language like this spoken with standard pronunciation. It's already got some pronunciation consequences. If you use an invariable tag, like isn't it or no, then all the time spent teaching how to manage English question tags is a waste of time. And uh, I want to get at this because she says that one of the things that goes wrong in international communication is unilateral idiomaticity, by which she means one of the speakers knows a native-like idiom and uses it, the listener doesn't know it, and so actually the idiomatic usage is a hindrance to communication and not not an advantage. So all my research on idioms may not be time very well spent because perhaps learners uh, shouldn't be devoting too much time at least to producing native-like idioms. Could an English as a lingua franca pronunciation ever emerge? It's hard to foresee how there could be enough international talk for this ever to happen. But then we didn't foresee the internet either. Call centers, I've sometimes wondered. At home in London, I'm rung about four times a day by somebody in India trying to sell me a mobile phone. Uh, I always answer politely, no thanks, so I never get to hear much of what they're going to tell me. But we're now seeing internet telephony. Maybe the internet will become partly or even mainly a spoken medium rather than a keyboarded one. And that could bring an enormous increase in the amount of international communication that's going on by spoken English. Overlooked in all this is what I think is the possible role of spelling in the development of an international pronunciation. Uh, we, we assume that uh, pronunciation is just heard and imitated, but Many learners actually are basing a lot of their pronunciation on what they see written down. So they may learn how to interpret English spelling and then invent new pronunciations. One of my colleagues, uh, Mark Huckvale, has actually come up with an ingenious idea called regular English. This is, instead of reforming spelling, what we do is reform pronunciation. We keep the spelling and change the pronunciation to, to match the spelling. Um, obviously, this is it's a witty idea. It's, it's a thought-provoking idea rather than a serious suggestion. But hidden in it is a very important realization that you're not going to get global change in English pronunciation without influence from spelling. It's going to be a factor. So I come back to these basic distinctions, what's described, what's taught, and what's learned. I still think that what is learned is totally of our, out of our control. It doesn't mean we shouldn't try. All we can do as phoneticians and linguists is go on describing, and all we can do as teachers is go on trying to set priorities and do a good job. But really, what will happen is just what will happen. We can't control it. So it remains for me to say thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you all again.